Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming to the track. Uh, the next speaker up is Daniel Messer, and the talk is A Shadow Librarian in Broad Daylight. Uh, please give Daniel a warm welcome. Thank you, man. How y'all doing? Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for coming. There's a whole lot of you here to see a librarian talk at DEF CON. So um, it's nice to have you. So uh, to start off with, quick disclaimer, you know, big, big disclaimer. Uh, hi, I'm not a hacker. I am not a cybersecurity expert. I will not be talking about how I crack some passwords that I found on the dark web and use that to infiltrate some system. I won't be talking about that because that's nothing I have ever done. Um, but I think that you and I and all of you and maybe I, uh, we share kind of a kindred relationship. Um, because though I am not a, I'm not a hacker, I think we can both, uh, we can come together on a relationship based in fear. Because people fear hackers, you know this. Some of you revel in this. And people are starting to fear others like me too. In red states, from city councils to state capitals, uh, I am a threat. And so are people like me. More legislation has been passed in the last few months to uh, curtail my activities than have been passed to curtail yours. Because I am fucking dangerous. I am a public librarian. In the third century before the Common Era, there was a great library in the city of Alexandria, Egypt. Many tales have been told about this library and some of them are even true. One thing that isn't talked about as often as I think it should be is the Alexandrian Acquisitions Department. Yeah, I know, I know, thrilling stuff, Miss me, but hang on, we're gonna go someplace beyond an ancient library, okay? See, there was a decree by Ptolemy II Philadelphus that, among other things, ordered agents of the library to, uh, to search the ships and take any books that they found, borrow them. Now, we're talking about the city of Alexandria. This was one of the biggest centers of trade in human history. We're talking about a lot of ships. These agents would snag any books and then bring them back to the library, where they would be copied and add it to the collection. Uh, it was often the case that the ships would sail away with the copies uh, while the library kept the originals. Um, this was the first large-scale version of a modern adage in that information should be free and it should belong to me. In the year of our goddess, 2024, can you imagine a library doing anything like that today? That library would have more lawyers at their front door than they have children attending the herpetologist event at a summer reading program. So, okay, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe some introductions before I really get into this. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, I've been working in libraries for almost 30 years now, uh, from the front desk to systems administration, and a few stops in between, yeah. As a, a systems librarian, I specialize in integrated library systems, which is the day-to-day -day operating system of a modern library, checking the things out, checking the things in, managing the catalog, all that stuff. Um, so what I'm called as a systems librarian by most people. If you, um, I'm also into things like uh, SQL hacking. I say that I'm a SQL hacker because uh, the way I typically get SQL to work is that I write a query, I swear because it doesn't work, then I rewrite the query and I'm closer but they're still swearing and finally the query works. So I, yeah, that's how I hack SQL. I'm also into data analysis and storytelling. Libraries love data. The sort of running joke is, is that librarians are into stats and cats. Um, so yeah, I'm, into, uh, I'm one of the data guys where I work. No surprise, I'm into library technology, self-checkout machines, self-check-in machines, everything from the barcode on the front desk to the RFID tags within the items. And this probably doesn't matter to anyone, I'm a circulation methodologist. In other words, I can help libraries better circulate their materials. But 
one, one, thing, um, one thing that you might also know me for is if you listen to library-related podcasts, I am known as your little free cyberpunk librarian. And with a name like that, it shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be a real big surprise that I am into shadow libraries. Um, I have been researching shadow libraries for about 10 years. I can't be, uh, I can't be uh, specific on that because I don't remember exactly when I started approaching it as a topic of research rather than as a topic of usage. Um, so yeah, I've done this for about 10 years. I've worked in shadow libraries as a uh, cataloger. In other words, if I am presented with an ebook of questionable sources um, and that ebook is lacking metadata, I can help provide that metadata. I've also worked in interlibrary loan, which uh, in this case usually involves someone on the internet needs a PDF and I can provide that PDF. But I've also done work in acquisitions, AKA book scanning, digitization, things like that. And I've also done some systems, uh, systems administration and development. So, okay, here's the deal. As a public librarian and a shadow librarian, I work in two sides of the library world. The public library, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and shadow libraries, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, so that might come as a surprise to you because why would, why would a legit librarian go to the dark side? You know, why, why would I do that? Well, you can encompass a lot of that under a heading of you do what you gotta do. I'm here to serve the public in matters of information and media. And to a librarian, everything is media. This podium, this podium I'm speaking from, Librarians can totally catalog and circulate this thing. Uh, we, ha we actually have a word for it. It's called realia. This is a realistic thing. It's not a book. It's not a, you know, a piece of like a Blu-ray or anything like that. This is realia. We can circulate this stuff. Uh, see, if you haven't been to your local public library recently, I strongly encourage you to go. Uh, the reasons for that are stuff that you probably already know, but I'll drop the two biggest ones just in case you need a reminder. Number one, we lend you stuff for free. And uh, with that, that could include stuff that uh, you didn't, um, you may not associate with public libraries, which is the number two reason you should go to the library and see what they have. If you think we're just a stronghold of books and Blu-rays, you might give it another look just in case. So, um, for instance, I work with libraries all across the country and some of them have tool collections and I'm not talking about the band. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're putting something together and maybe you need a hammer or a cordless drill or something like that, but you're not a handy person, you're not Norm Abram, so you don't want to just buy this, you're just assembling something that you bought at Ikea, check. Check with your local library. They, uh, they might have a tool collection for you. Um, do you want to learn how to play the guitar? Some libraries have musical instrument collections. So this is great because you can go lend, they can, they, you can borrow that guitar and you don't have to buy one because later on if you find out, well, playing the guitar isn't for me or I'm just not good at that. Well, if you bought a guitar, now you have a symbol of your failure laying around your house. With the, with the borrowed guitar, you just take it back to the library. So, I work with a library that has a massive collection of cake pans. Literally, lots of cake pans. And you might think, cake pans? Well, how often do you need to make a Hello Kitty birthday cake? Maybe once a year? So why should you buy a Hello Kitty cake shaped cake pan for the other 364 days? Just go borrow the thing. So, podiums, right? I'm just saying, sometimes people need to talk in front of a crowd. And uh, you know what they might not have? Podium. It's not something you got laying around your house most of the time. A library could buy, catalog, and circulate one of these things. I would not be surprised if that's something that's already happening in a library somewhere. So as I said, I am here to serve the public about information and media, and sometimes that stuff doesn't come easy. At one point in your lives, you may have gone to a library for a story time. Um, so, you have your very own librarian right here, so let's have a story time. Sit back, relax. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories because it's the war stories track, right? Um, I was going to bring puppets, 
But when I explained to the DEF CON organizers what I wanted to do with them, they shot that idea down for ethical reasons. So. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a law. It's a pretty good law, as laws go. And its name was Title 17, United States Code, subsection 109A. Thank you. <laughs> Big fans! Anyway. <laughs> uh, this little bit of legislation does us the small service of providing only the entire foundation of how libraries operate in the United States. But please, Title 17, United States Code, subsection 109A, that's a very long name, very complicated. So it's got a nickname. It's called the First Sale Doctrine. Simply stated, this law allows libraries to buy physical items and lend them. We can lend books, Blu-rays, and banjos. Uh, because when we buy them, we own them. And because we own them, we can decide to lend them to others. So more than one person has said that if a, a library didn't exist today, it would probably be illegal to create one. And that's because media publishers would never let a law like this pass if this was something that came forward today. So this law is great though when it comes to physical items. What about the digital stuff? So hey, you might not have known this either if you haven't been to the library for a little while. Uh, did you know you can check out stuff at the library and never leave your home? You can get things from ebooks and digital comics. You can stream music and movies. Uh, you can download magazines and read the news. You don't even have to put on pants. Just get your tablet, get your phone, log into your library account, and get stuff for free. Legally. For a change. And that, dear hearts, that's the problem. Digital items are not sold. They're licensed. And licensing does not equal ownership. And libraries all across the country are seeing a steep rise in their public's desire for digital items. Okay, well, so what? Well, how much do you pay for a, an ebook on Amazon? Maybe about 15 bucks or so, give or take, you know, if it's new or it's big or whatever. Say about 15 bucks. And keep in mind, you are licensing it too. You don't own that. Um, but you are just a single licensee reading the book on your devices. Fine. Libraries, on the other hand, we want to lend ebooks to multiple people so they can read it on multiple devices. And publishers, they don't like that. They absolutely see that as lost sales. Do you know how much a library will pay for the same ebook that you bought on Amazon for 15 bucks? 60. They will pay about four times the cost so that you can have access to an ebook. And that's for a single user license. Well, what the hell is a single user license? A single user license basically says that one person can check out that ebook at a time, just like a physical book. It's an ebook. It's not like we have a problem making copies of it, but the licensing is that one person can have that book at a time. So more than that, publishers will also literally withhold sales to, to libraries um, because they want to hit that buyer's market first. The new, you know, James Patterson pulls a lever and publishes a novel and the, the publisher might not offer that as a ebook to libraries because they want to hit that buyer's market first. Those freeloading librarians can just wait to pay four times the amount for that ebook uh, because, you know, the publishing industry got to get paid, son. Oh, and by the way, that license is good for anywhere from a few months to maybe a couple years. And then the library has to license the book again. Why? Did it wear out? <laughs> Actually, that's the story. The publishers uh, and the sellers will tell you that a physical book will wear out over time, so you're going to need to replace it. So that's all we're doing. We're just emulating what's happening in the physical book. That's okay, right? Beloved, there are books in libraries that are over 200 years old. 
Travel to Europe, there are books and libraries that are centuries old. Um, yeah, you might not be able to check them out and take them home, granted, but I bet they're still somehow available for use. There's not an ebook around right now that is even half as old as some of the oldest books in, an, in a library. In other words, this is just good old fashioned bog standard capitalism at work. You, you've heard of forced scarcity, I'm sure. This is enforced scarcity. We live in a time where nothing, nothing ever needs to go out of print. And even things that have gone out of print, they could be digitized, resurrected, and brought forward. And, you know, Google did that. And they got away with it because they're Google. And then the Internet Archive did that, got sued, and had to remove 500,000 books from their collection. Um, because, of course, of course, that represents a loss of sales. As a counterpoint, according to Publishers Weekly and the Association of American Publishers, the United States publishing industry made over $12.5 billion last year. We should all have some of those lost sales. How do they survive? And with the growing demand for ebooks, library budgets are feeling that pinch more than ever because ebook licenses are more or less twice the price of a physical book. A new dead tree book might cost 20, 25 bucks. A library could buy two books for 50 bucks or they can buy one single ebook license for $10 more. I mean, fiscally, those physical items make more sense, but that's not what people are after. And beyond that, though, what do you do when you're faced with a patron who needs an item, but that item is almost unobtainable? Because Amikoi, my God, we haven't even talked about things like the price of journals, like academic journals. Any students here today, anyone working on a bachelor's, a master's, maybe even a doctorate? I got, I got a few hands. Awesome. Okay, so do you know how much money your college library spends per year for access to academic articles and publications? I want you to think of a number, a price that sounds reasonable, let's not get cos cos you know, cosmically stratospheric here, but a price that sounds reasonable. What do you think your university is paying for access to those academic journals? Got that number? No, you're wrong, it's higher. The, the cost of academic journals and access to those publications is insane and it's obscene and never mind that many of the articles that these students are after were written by researchers and scientists working with public funds. So if you're a student browsing a database of publications at your uni's library and you find what you need, I mean, Holy crap, here it is. This is, this is what I'm looking for. I know this author. They're working in my arena. This will go a long way to helping me finish my master's thesis or my doctoral dissertation. Fantastic. And they don't have it. This is the heartbreak of the abstract, where all they have is the abstract. Your library, for some reason, just does not have access to that article. So, imagine yourself now as a librarian. You've got that patron looking for a book that's had one print run and hasn't been published again since the 1970s. You've got a patron who needs an indie film that was made in 1990 and can't be found anywhere. Or you've got this student who needs the article, but you don't have it. When I was in high school, never mind how many years ago, a friend of mine taught me something that literally stuck with me ever since. I could put this on a business card and it would make some sense for me. And that thing is, is when what you need don't meet your eyes, you must learn to improvise. So, time to improvise. Due to patron confidentiality, I will not divulge the title of this book except to say it was a work of fiction written in the 1970s by some author I had never heard of. The patron read this book back in their younger days. And like a fever dream, it popped into their head again, and they just, they needed to read it again. And hey, I get it. I don't know about you, but as a librarian, there's certain books that I always go back to. I cannot tell you how many times I've read Neuromancer and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's like comfort food. 
Now, libraries have various networks that they can go through to do something magical. And that magical thing is interlibrary loan. And if you're not familiar with it, no shame. Today, you are one of today's lucky 10,000. So let me tell you about interlibrary loan. See, if you go to a library and they don't have the thing you need, you can talk to someone there and they can try to get it from another library. Maybe even in a completely different state, sometimes in a completely different country. You may have to pay for shipping, but they can help you get that weird and wonderful thing that cannot be found anywhere else. And that's exactly what I did. I, you know, worked with this patron, I looked it up in the computer, we placed a request through an interlibrary loan network, and we waited for the item to arrive. Which it did. It just the next week. In pieces. <laughs> It's a paperback from the 1970s. Do you know what they used to make binding glue out of in the 1970s? Lysergic acid, diethylamide, and the dreams of small children. <laughs> I called this patron and I said, hey, um, I got your thing, but there's this problem. And they were heartbroken. That's one of my favorite patrons. They were afraid to check it out because they didn't want to further damage that. I don't know how they would have done that other than like sticking it in a blender with some protein powder. Um, but damn it, I hated to disappoint this person. And the lending library that responded was the only lending library that responded. It was either this copy or nothing. Time for the lie. This patron, I'll call him Joe. I'm talking to him on the phone. I said, hey Joe, do you have an e-reader? You do. That's awesome. Hey, what kind of e-reader you got? Uh-huh. That new Kindle? Yeah, right. How do you like it? Nice. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to I'm going to check in a different ILL system real quick. This one deals in digital copies. And no, no, Joe. I know you already looked, but I'm a librarian. Let me do my job. And oh my god, Joe, check it out. I found it. It's right here. No, this one library, they've got it. Um I need to contact them to see, uh, see what I need to do to borrow it, but I'll give you a call back in a couple days. Okay, talk to you later, Joe. Bye. Beloved, did you know you can scan a paper back in about 30 minutes? Uh, I took the book home, and this was before I got a proper book scanner. I have tools now, but I just had at the time, a, you know, regular run-of-the-mill, pretty decent, flatbed scanner. And it was great because you could easily fit the pages on the glass, uh, you know, the glass part of the scanner and push what was left of the binding up against the, uh, you know, up against the thing. Got some good pages. And, you know, I threw on a podcast and about half an hour later I had a bunch of images of pages which I could feed to ScanTailor, a bit of software that I think the Internet Archive still uses for um, ingesting, OCRing and converting images of pages into actual ebooks. Um, it's not pretty, but it works. Uh, well, and then, then after I'm done, well, this patron has a Kindle, so obviously I needed to use Caliber to convert it to Moby format. And two days later, I gave him a copy of a favorite book that he had not read in 30 years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're far too kind. All right. This is one of my favorite stories of all time. I'll be telling this until I die. Uh, and this worked because of people like what I'm looking at, at here at DEF CON. In the 1990s, a bunch of punks made a movie. And I mean that literally. I want to tell you a story about Terminal City Ricochet. This is, the one, this is one of the most independent of indie films. It's a punk rock counterculture cyberpunk cult masterpiece starring, well, featuring Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys and Joe Keithley of DOA. So, uh, there was this, uh, there was this person. I mean, well, let me back up. So why is this, why is this thing hard to find? Um, so this, this, uh, this movie was made in sunny British Columbia, which is not Hollywood. Um, it has a soundtrack with some raging Canadian punk bands. 
And as I said, in 2023, late 2023, it was almost entirely unobtainable. I mean, they probably printed, you know, just a few DVDs and VHS cassettes and probably sold them through their friends and independent shops and stuff like that. So they're just strewn to the four winds. You could not even find it on eBay. And you can't pirate it because if you want to pirate something, you need to kind of have a copy of it. So, one day on Mastodon, someone started asking around about this movie and they wanted to get a copy of it. And that was proven to be difficult, if not impossible. So, by the way, I don't know if he's here, but big shout out to the Gibson for hosting, running, and putting up with all the insanity that is the Hackers.Town Mastodon server. Um, uh, you know, awesome, awesome work there. And that's what facilitated this whole thing. This user had checked out some libraries and they couldn't find it. And someone just popped up, I didn't even know who this person was, popped up and said, hey, have you asked Cyberpunk Librarian? He might know a way to get it. So they checked a bunch of libraries. They had not, however, checked WorldCat. Now, if you don't know, WorldCat is a massive catalog of library materials in libraries all over the globe. And it's run by a company called OCLC. Now, I'm not going to get into the problems inherent with OCLC and modern libraries because we don't have the time and they only allowed me a shot and not the entire bottle. I, but I will tell you that if you want to see if you can find something in a library somewhere, your first stop is worldcat.org. So start there. And using WorldCat, I found a copy, one single copy. And do you know where it was? No surprises, Greater Victoria Public Library in beautiful British Columbia. So, uh, yeah, we were able to, uh, you know, on Mastodon, we were able to work with each other. And, uh, you know, a little back and forth, we found a Victorian local who literally lived down the street from this library. Now, this is a rare piece of media, but you could check it out. And they did, and they ripped us a beautiful digital copy, including the soundtrack. <laughs> um, so, you know, and they provide it for this person who was doing everything they could to obtain it legally. So, there was this guy, I'm sure you've not heard of him, because there's librarians that might never heard of him. His name was Ranganathan. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. He wrote down the five laws of library science. These are still pretty good today. And as you can see, the third law is every book its reader, or in this case, every DVD its viewer. So, within a few days, a long lost movie had been reobtained, and nowadays, strangely enough, you can view it on the Internet Archive. Funny how that happened. Okay, circling back, let's go back to that student who needed the article that their library didn't have access to. Now, there's something that you need to understand about libraries and librarians in that it's kind of an insular world. We know lots of other librarians. And you know what librarians love to do? They love to talk to other librarians. Um, so, okay, fine, but what does that mean for the student? Well, we've got a stat request for this article. They need this, the paper's due next week, and oh my god. Okay, well, even back in the day, before, you know, all the cool internet stuff and things, a good, interli a good interlibrary loan librarian, which is hard to say, could turn this request around in hours, if not minutes. Because yes, there is a formal process that you have to go through to request an interlibrary loan, which you can totally do after you've made a phone call to your friend at the other library way over there and said, hey, I got a student that needs this thing. Can you give a copy of it and send it? Yeah, I'll check my email later. I'll send you over the request later this afternoon. Thanks, bye. Now, while I'm not an interlibrary loan coordinator anymore, um, I have worked as an interlibrary loan coordinator over the course of my career. I've been in, I've actually done it for three separate times. I've been on both sides of that conversation. So, these days, like I said, I work in interlibrary loan as a shadow librarian. What that means is literally I'll, I'll watch Reddit, I'll watch Discord or, you know, chat room, whatever, and someone needs a PDF. They don't have access to that PDF. And maybe I do, and suddenly they have access to that PDF. It's very simple. Um, 
But to uh, kind of kind of move beyond even that, if you listen to podcasts or uh, watch YouTube videos, which I bet some of you do, um, you will hear someone occasionally say something along the lines of, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer. Or I'm a therapist, but I'm not your therapist. Librarians are different. In a capitalistic society, the public library remains one of the few places where you can go and be there and exist in a location, and no one expects you to pay for it. I, am, I take pride in being part of a rare organization that can literally say, Hi, I'm from the government and I'm here to help and people don't laugh at me. <laughs> I said people don't laugh at me. But uh, the funny thing about librarians, we'll teach you how to do our job. We'll show you how to do what we do. And in essence, we kind of cut ourselves out of the, uh, out of the process. And it's not that we don't want to lose you as a patron, uh, but because we believe in education, okay? Um, and even then, we'll, we'll always be there to back you up. We don't expect you to be experts. Um, so if you're having trouble using the library, you can't find something, well, hey, we are still there. And it doesn't matter if you're standing in a brick and mortar library. It doesn't matter if you're chatting to a librarian online or trying to find something on Mastodon, Discord, Reddit, whatever. So, let present me help future you. Like Liam Neeson, I have a particular set of skills because I can offer guidance and assistance from a public librarian's point of view and from a shadow librarian's standpoint as well. So just a few things to consider. If you ever need to go researching something, and you need in-depth information beyond what a search engine can provide. First, don't discount your public library. And I'm not saying that because I want you to support your library. Folks, your tax is paid for the library. You're supporting the library. You may as well go use it. It's one of the few places where you can go use the things you paid for. You paid for the cop cars, go drive one, see how it works. <sighs> But there is one thing that shadow libraries suck at. They're just not good at it at all. And I love shadow libraries. Um, and that thing is browsing. Serendipity is a hell of a discovery tool. Uh, for example, I write ghost stories. I have a podcast called AM800 WRTH, and it's like a night gallery thing in that this fictional AM radio station provides a delivery mechanism for the ghost story. Um, so, yeah, just the same way that the gallery did for the spooky TV story. So I popped into the uh, Warren County Public Library in Bowling Green, Kentucky, because I wanted to find some ghost stories that I could, you know, have as maybe some ticklers, something, you know, I'm not plagiarizing, I just need ideas, damn it. And my father's side of the family is from Appalachia, which now that you've heard me talk for a little while might not surprise you. And that is a culture with a wonderful richness of ghost stories. And I figured, hey, I could find something along those lines. And I sure did. That was easy. I mean, 133. That's the Dewey Decimal number for specific topics in the paranormal, parapsychological, and occultism. Uh, I didn't even use the library's catalog because I'm a professional, damn it. So I go straight to the shelf. And I'm standing there with a couple of, you know, a couple of shelves of, you know, ghost stories. And that's when I noticed something. Wow, this one guy, uh, William Lidwood Montel, okay. Um, he's got a hell of a lot of books here, um, right here in this section. Uh, and most all of them are about paranormal stories and incidents in the state of Kentucky. What's that about? Well, you know what else is in Bowling Green, Kentucky? Western Kentucky University. And if you know anything about the paranormal, you might know that John Carpenter went to Western Kentucky University. His father was a professor at Western Kentucky University, and so was Dr. William Linwood Montell. Um, this was a man that was involved in editing, writing, publishing about 28 books. He was a folklorist. He studied what he called the history of the common people. Um, I had never heard of this guy until I'm standing in a library looking at a couple shelves of books and then suddenly I'm a big fan. 
Browsing a well-ordered collection of information and media might not help you find exactly what you want, but you could find what you need. Um, libraries are great for that, and yeah, so are bookstores, but in a library you can borrow the thing and pay nothing. Gather your sources. Yeah, yeah, sometimes the shortest distance between two points is a search on Anna's archive, and suddenly you have an ebook that you didn't have before. But you remember WorldCat? You can, uh, you can set up an account on WorldCat, totally free, and you can give it your zip code. And now if you want to see if you can find that weird and wonderful thing that you need to read right now, you can check WorldCat and it will tell you if it's any libraries that are close to you, sometimes within driving distance. Um, so not only do you want to you know, worry about that, but you can also uh, check out your library's uh, collection of databases. Um, yeah, libraries have got great collections, but depending on your library, they're going to have things like magazine and newspaper databases. They're going to have business databases, medical databases, legal databases. You need forms? They probably got your forms. Hell, lots of libraries have an online language learning system where you can learn a foreign language and you won't have to put up with a guilt trip from a little green owl. So. You may not need any of this stuff today, you might not need it tomorrow, but next week, next month, who knows? Check out other libraries, online or in person. This is not meant to be an exclusive relationship. We are not monogamous here, at least not when it comes to the libraries. What you do on your own time is up to you. Um, but is there something your library is lacking? Okay, check another. Back in the COVID days, a library set up a thing where you could uh, sign up online for a digital library card that allowed you access to the ebook, and, you know, e-content collections and the databases and stuff. There was no charge for it. And in most cases, there still isn't. And that card might only be good for maybe six months or so, but hey, six months might be all you need. If you want to get something that's, you know, more permanent, almost any library will offer you a library card with full borrowing privileges for some kind of fee. Back in the shadows for a moment, remember that there is a thriving ebook community in other places besides Zed Library and Anna's Archive and stuff. Check out IRC. Remember IRC? Good times those were. There's a couple channels there on Undernet called eBooks and Books. That's a books with a Z on the end of it. Um, you know, check that out. Easy to use, especially if you know how to use IRC. But outside of all of that, today I would like to offer you a fantastic opportunity. I have a timeshare. No. Um, I would like to offer you a fantastic opportunity to be someone else's librarian. Listen, all of you, you're, you're here at DEF CON, right? I think so. I haven't hallucinated this bad in ages. Um, that means, oops, I think I just got out of that. There we go. That means that you too have a particular set of skills. You know things. And you know how to find things. And you know how to do things with what you have learned. You know about torrents. You know about Anna's archive. You know how to break DRM. I could have totally put in a talk topic where I stood up here, talked about how DRM works on digital library materials, how you could strip that shit off and then make those files available for someone else to get a hold of, you know, that may not have access to it. I didn't do that because I think it'd be boring, because I bet, I bet, many of you already know how to do that shit already. And if you don't, you can learn it in an afternoon, believe me. But across the United States right now, right-wing legislators and fascists, sorry, but I repeat myself there, are effectively banning books and materials in libraries and schools. Is it related to sex? Ban it. Anything to do with the GOBTQ community? That's got to go. Uh, does it involve a non-Christian deity? No, can't have that. Um, but it goes beyond that. Some states, namely, let's see if I can do this, Arkansas, Idaho, Indiana, Missouri, Montana, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Tennessee have tried to pass laws that make multiple aspects of public librarianship a criminal offense. And in some states, they succeeded. 
in, uh, in Oklahoma, school and public librarians are looking at up to $20,000 in fines or 10 years in prison for exposing children to obscene materials, whatever the hell that is. In, uh, in uh, Montana, school library and museum uh, employees face prosecution for dealing in obscene materials. Have you got a Renaissance exhibit coming through town? Does it have pictures of naked people? You might go to jail if a kid comes to the museum. Sounds great, doesn't it? So, what can you do to help? It's very easy. Share your skills, share the media. Now, you can take that however you like. You might be thinking, oh, I, I see what he's saying. He's encouraging me to liberate DRM encumbered materials and make sure that others can access those materials, uh, regardless of the capitalist bullshit, unconstitutional laws, and oppressive governments. And you'd be right. <laughs> you... Or... You might think, hey, he's suggesting, I know what he's saying, I, he's suggesting that I should scan and copy and digitize materials that aren't even available online, and then put them online. And you'd be correct. Um, or, you might be thinking, hey, I, uh, I know a kid, and they really need to read Gender Queer. Because they're going through some shit right now, man. And uh, maybe I should get them a copy of their own because their state banned that book in public and school libraries. That's good, too. I'm going to close this out with a, uh, with a dirty little secret about me that's not really a dirty little secret if, uh, if you know anything about me. I never finished my library degree. I started working in libraries uh, 30 years ago. I've never been able to finish my library degree because I'm too busy doing library work. I've shelved books, worked the front desk, reference desk, children's desk, built curriculum, taught classes, installed tech, fixed tech, fixed problems, started problems, migrated systems, abandoned systems, created workflows, created databases, wrote SQL, wrote PHP, wrote documentation, and wrote an entire goddamn book on how to use a very specific database in a very specific library system. I did all that shit without a degree. I started working in libraries 30 years ago. You can start today. You can be someone else's librarian, even if they're, even if they're your only patron. All you need to do is help and share. Anything you don't know, you're allowed to look it up. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Derek Brown for browbeating me into being here. Rise above, my friends. Enjoy the rest of DEF CON. They got a thing coming up, I'm sure, in a few minutes. I'm going to head out into the hallway if you want to ask me questions. Well, hi, I'm a librarian. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll meet y'all out there. Thank you all for coming. There's a hell of a lot more of you than I thought there would be. And thank you for having me.